Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, your moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access the webinar on demand. Following today's presentation, we'll be sending out an email that contains a link for you to access the webinar. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And uh, we'll hopefully get to as many questions as we can during today's presentation. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our three lucky winners today. Okay, with that, we will kick off today's webinar, which is when not to use machine learning. Our speaker today is Anais Dodis Georgiou, who is Developer Advocate, Developer Relations at Influx Data. Hi, Anais, how are you? Hi, Charlene. I'm doing well. Thanks great, for the introduction. Great. How are You're you? welcome. I'm doing great, thanks. I'm going to put myself on mute and I'm going to let you do your thing. All right, sounds good. I don't know how I'm going to compete with that smooth, like soothing voice of yours, but um, we'll try. <laughs> yeah, well, I, it's a face made for radio. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just go ahead and whatever. Knock yourself out. All right, go sounds ahead. good. Um, just make sure this works. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I will be talking about when not to use machine learning and more specifically about when and how to use Holt Winter's forecasting method with Influx Data and InfluxDB. So a little bit about me before we get started so I can remember what it's like to speak and uh, have an opportunity to share a little bit about myself. So I've been with Influx Data for about one year now. I'm a developer advocate, which means that I get to represent the company to the community and the community back to the company. So I help answer your questions um, on the community Slack channel and our community page. And I write blogs and tutorials and also give webinars like these. So um, the reason why we have a lot of developer advocates at Influx Data is because the whole platform is open source. So just a quick overview, we are a time series database and we also have a collection agent, a visualization platform, and then also a uh, data alert um, management tool and a processing engine. So if you take that data that's in the database and you need to do any sort of transformations, you can use uh, Capacitor, which is the, the data processing engine, to do that. And then you can put them back into InfluxDB or send them to a different database as well. Um, I am Ana East, Jackie Dotis on LinkedIn. I encourage you to find me on LinkedIn and connect with me there. And then also throughout this presentation, I will have included a bunch of little doodles and illustrations. I really enjoy drawing in my spare time. And if you like them, uh, go check them out on Instagram as well. I included this picture of a chicken on a pogo stick, a spring chicken, because I'm new to tech. I was at Oracle briefly before this in sales but um, only very briefly. And um, after doing that, I went um, to a data science boot camp, and then I came here. Um, and my background before that is in biomedical engineering, and I spent a lot of time in a lab that was very sterile, no windows, all white. And even though I really enjoyed the work I was doing conceptually, uh, day to day, it would get a little bit repetitive. I guess that's why they call it research. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, programming liquid handling robots. So I got kind of introduced to some of, the, some of the basic logic about programming from that job. But I was also working closely with data scientists. And I got really jealous of the work that they were doing. I thought that they were the ones that actually got to deliver um, the products and the diagnoses to the patients. And I I wanted to do that. So I, I decided that that's when I decided I was going to enroll in a data science boot camp, and shortly after that, I became a developer advocate at Influx. Um, so now that you know a little bit about me, let's actually get started. So I'm going to be talking about 
how you can use Holt Winters with Influx data. So once you get your data into InfluxDB, you can just use um, Influx, you can just use a Holt Winters um, forecasting method to create predictions on your univariate time series data. And before I go into this agenda, um, I just want to warn you, this is going to be like a mini bravery test uh, in the immortal words of Bob, Bob Ross. Um, so, and I say that because this agenda is going to sound kind of heavy. So if you're not a big math person like I am, you might get overwhelmed, but I just want to give you this agenda so we know where we're headed. And if you feel like there's some stuff that I'm covering that's a little bit over your head, I promise I'm going to go into more detail. Um, but I'm just going to kind of lead us down this meandering path and we're going to start by talking about how machine learning compares to statistical or classical methods for forecasting in the univariate time series space. Because it turns out, spoiler alert, that machine learning is actually not the good choice. And the reason why is because um, time series data has some um, intrinsic properties to it that doesn't lend itself well to a lot of machine learning methods. Um, and then uh, I'll briefly talk about when it does make sense to use machine learning. Next, we're gonna go a little bit deeper and start actually talking about Holt Winters. So first thing I want you to know about this presentation is that Holt Winters is synonymous with triple exponential smoothing. Um, they're the same name, it's just that Holt and Winters created it and um, it is called triple exponential smoothing. So I'll use those words interchangeably. And in order to familiarize you guys with Holt Winters, I want to take a step back and actually talk about single exponential smoothing because if we can understand single exponential smoothing first, then we'll be able to understand triple exponential really, smoothing really easily. And then next I'll talk about a conceptual overview of how to optimize for single exponential smoothing because it turns out that with a lot of forecasting methods, one of the very first steps that you have to perform is an optimization step. You have to find some initial parameters in order to make any forecast at all. And so I'll kind of talk about that, how that's done conceptually for single exponential smoothing, and I'll talk about it through a math analogy. So instead of talking directly about single exponential smoothing, I'll actually talk about linear regression or how we find the line of best fit because they're very similar and you might be really familiar with linear regression, so hopefully it'll be a little bit more tangible. And then I'll talk about, um, in order to optimize anything, you actually have to first uh, have a way of calculating the error or measuring um, the performance. So I'll talk about how that's done for linear regression and how it's done for single exponential smoothing. And then finally, now we've set up the, the foundation um, and we're ready to talk about how single exponential smoothing relates to triple exponential smoothing. And um, then I'll go a little bit into some detail about how we actually calculate um, the error for Holt Winters. And then after that, um, we'll start to feel a little overwhelmed, which is kind of where I want to put you in the position I want to put you in, because hopefully at this point, by that point in the presentation, you'll understand that math is getting a little bit hairier and that in order to optimize Holt Winters, we actually need to use a numerical method instead of, and I'm using air quotes now, real math, and I'll describe what a numerical method is, what numerical method we use for Holt Winters to optimize um, and find our initial parameters. Um, and then finally, um, if you're exhausted and you don't like math and you hated all that, that's fine because uh, this part of the presentation will be for you. I can show you how you can forget everything that I taught you today and just use one um, query, one line to generate a prediction with InfluxDB. And then finally, I will also share a list of learning resources um, because they were all the resources that I used to learn about Holt Winters in case you really do like math a lot and you want to learn more about it. All right, so yeah, like I said, it's a long path, but we're, we're, we're gonna go on this journey. So um, as promised, I'm gonna talk to you about when does it make sense to use machine learning for time series predictions? And it turns out that if you have univariate time series data, meaning that your data only has one value and one timestamp attached to it. So for example, maybe it's stock prices that you're looking at. If that's what your data looks like, it turns out that machine learning methods they all perform um, 
more poorly than statistical methods. And that's because time series data has serial dependence intrinsically. What that means is that the value of your data is going to be dependent on what time it is. And that makes time series data unique. And um, as a result, there's um, usually autocorrelation in your data or seasonality. And this, this attribute of time series data um, ends up making these machine learning methods overfit that type of data, time series data. Uh, so a lot of them end up not being good predictors in the univariate time series space. Now, of course, several people, several companies, brilliant people have used machine learning incredibly successfully with time series data, but that's in the multivariate time series space. So when you are comparing, for example, news sentiments with the weather and tweets with your stock prices, um, all in the same time frame, that's multivariate time series data. And in that instance, uh, machine learning methods do do succeed in the Excel. Um, so this graph that we're looking at is um, from this research paper entitled Statistical Machine Learning Forecasting Methods, Concerns and Ways Going Forward, precisely because um, a lot of really popular machine learning methods for forecasting in time series like uh, K-nearest neighbor or long short term memory networks have gotten a lot of press, but they really don't perform that well. So this graph lists a bunch of different methods and the y-axis is the error or the difference between the prediction or the forecast and the actual value. And we can see that all the statistical methods there in the very front have the lowest error. And um, ETS, which is the, the one at the far left with a pr the lowest prediction error of 7.12, um, is also known as exponential triple smoothing, or sorry, um, exponential trend and smoothing method, um, it's a sibling of Holt Winters. So another reason why I wanted to talk and share um, Holt Winters with you is not only because you can use it really easily with Influx, but because it's a it's incredibly similar to ETS. So if you do enjoy learning about algorithms and you um, want to learn about ETS, you'll have an excellent foundation to do so after this presentation, I hope. <laughs> um, so before we even get started with single exponential smoothing, let's just take a second to even remember like what forecasting is. And in its essence, it's just using past observations to um, create a forecast. And the most simplest way that this is described is by the naive method, where y of t hat, the forecast, is equal to y of t from the previous day. So in this table here, I have a bunch of dates and some sales. And my forecast is just going to be equal to the data from the day before. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, why would Naive want to be credited with such a simple model? But it turns out that it's actually quite good at predicting financial data. And if you even just use the, there's studies that show like even, you even just use the Naive method for like stock prices that it gives you like a pretty a decent return. Um, and so it, it actually has, surprising value because it's even though it's so obvious and also another advantage of it is that if we were to also take the percent difference between the actual and forecast um, all of a sudden we see that we have a negative percent change every three days so all of a sudden we've uncovered seasonality that maybe we didn't see from just looking at this table like the actual values or even if we plotted it we might not have noticed that we have seasonality present in our data so even really simple forecasting methods like the naive method can um, eliminate both trends in our data and uh, give us tangible value. So single exponential smoothing, um, and remember I'm talking about single exponential smoothing because we're going to talk about triple exponential smoothing later or Holt Winters. Single exponential smoothing agrees with the naive method in that the future values can be predicted from looking at the past, but it goes a little bit further to say that what's happened most recently should have the largest impact on what happens next, and that we should also take into account all of the rest of our data. So in SES, it gets its name, exponential smoothing, from being just an exponentially weighted average of all our past values. And um, so again, y hat of t plus one, that's the forecasted value, y of t, y of t minus one, y of t minus two, et cetera, those are all our data points. And alpha is a smoothing parameter. A smoothing parameter just relates the previous smooth statistic to the current observation, and it's what's used to actually produce the weighted average of all of our data. 
Um, so uh, there's a lot of different methods. You might be thinking to yourself, how do we pick the right alpha? And the way that we're going to do that is um, through uh, minimizing the RSS. And we'll go into that later. But um, one thing I want you to notice before we talk about that is that if we imagine the alpha is one, then all of our one minus alpha terms, uh, they go to zero and we're back to the naive method. So you can see how this was just built upon the naive method. Additionally, what we're also saying when we set alpha equal to one is that we want all of our weights to, um, all of our data to be more heavily weighted towards the data that happened most recently. And as we set alpha equal to zero, then we're saying that we want pat, like very um, past observations to have a larger effect on our data, um, on our prediction. So the closer it is to one, the more you're shifting your weight towards recent data, and the closer it is to zero, the more you're shifting your weight uh, to past data. So for example, if alpha equals 0 0.2, in this table here we see that alpha transform we have all those values, and you'll notice that the values decrease more and more and more. So the weights in the past have less of a value, less of an effect on the prediction. Um, and also, this uh, series um, is known as a ge geometric convergence. So all of the sum of all these alphas equals to one, and all that means is that it ensures that our forecast is going to be on the same scale as our prediction, and that's why it's written in the way that it is. Um, people needed to find a way to both take an exponential weight of something and have it be um, in such a way that uh, the sum is going to be on the same same scale. So next, let's look at the component form of SES. So all this is is um, an iterative way of expressing this formula. And um, mathematicians love to rewrite formulas, so they did it like this, just so that they could use LT to denote um, the smoothing equation and LT minus one will just denote the previous forecast. And in this way, we get to encapsulate the iterative nature of this equation that we see here um, really concisely. And the reason why I'm introducing it is because it's the same way that Holt Winters is commonly expressed. So I wanted to familiarize you with it so that when you see Holt Winters, um, you have something that makes sense and is tangible. Um, So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I have a couple questions. Hopefully you have a couple questions. Maybe you haven't thought that far. Maybe I've overwhelmed you already, but I hope not. But um, one question would be, uh, what do we set alpha to? You tell me that alpha can be zero, between zero and one. Okay, great, but what do I use for alpha? And then also, what happens at t equals zero? Um, so I have my first data point. I have a y of t. Uh, I have an L of T, but what is LT minus one? That's in his initialization parameter. So in order to find the optimum, optimal alpha and um, L uh, T minus one or negative one, or what is most commonly referred to as L naught, we need to perform an optimization step. And instead of showing you the optimization for single exponential smoothing, I wanted to take a second and actually show you how um, linear regression is performed. And the reason why I'm going to do that instead is because it's an excellent math analogy in the smoothing equation for single exponential smoothing looks a lot like the point slope form of a line. What do I mean by that? Well, LT is our output. Alpha is constant, so it's kind of like the slope. Y of T, although in time series we don't have really independent variables, it's you can think of it like X. And um, L naught is going to be an initial value, so it's also a constant. So one minus alpha L naught all reduces to a constant value, and we can think of that as the y-intercept or b. So now we have a point-slope form of a line, and we're ready to perform um, uh, linear regression optimization. So the way that uh, we find the the line of best fit is by drawing a line across our data in our data and finding the RSS. And the RSS stands for the residual sum of squares. And all it is is the difference between our data point and the point on the line. We take that value, we square it, and then we do that for all of our data points. 
and that value is equal to the RSS. So if you can't visualize that just through words, that's okay. I have created some pictures. So here's our data, um, nice and random, and uh, we want to find the line of best fit. So we draw a line through it, and that line has a certain m value, a certain slope, and it also has a certain y-intercept, a b value. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the error between uh, our data point and that line. And so that error is going to be equal to y1 minus the value at that point of the line, which is also equal to mx1 plus b. And we're going to take that, that error, we're going to square it, and then add all of our other errors together, and that's going to give us our RSS. And so that would be one RSS value that we have. Now, if we drew a different line somewhere else, um, all of a sudden the distances between our points and our lines would be different. So we'd get a different RSS value. And if we did that 100 million times or whatever, maybe not that many times, 100 times, um, and we plotted all of those values, we would get something that looks like this. So this pink bowl here represents all of the errors for all of the different lines that we can draw. And the very bottom of this bowl is where we're going to find our optimal M and B. So the way that this these optimal m and b or optimal slope and um, y-intercept values are found is by constructing this graph and then um, taking the partial derivative with respect to m and b of the um, RSS of this pink bowl and setting it equal to zero. And then we solve for m and b and then those are our optimal values and now we are able to create our line of best fit. So that's what happens every time that you use linear regression. Um, which is pretty cool, I think. And so now I'm going to show you the proof. I'm not going to go into it, but um, if you're curious, it's here. And I just wanted to go through it because I wanted to give you a sense of how, even though this is a very simple problem that we often take for granted and we use in our analysis all the time, um, if you do data science or data analysis, it's not entirely trivial. It has some, some partial derivatives, which is kind of fancy, I guess, uh, depending on how much you like math or the math that you do. Um, and so even something this simple is kind of complicated. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is just to give you an appreciation for the math that is involved, because when we start talking about the optimization process that's involved with performing um, Holt-Winters optimization and finding those initial parameters, now I hope you'll have a feel for how much more complicated it's going to be and why it is that we can't just use math like this to find a solution and why we need to use um, numerical methods to do that. So this is what Holt-Winters looks like. Um, it's also known as triple exponential smoothing, and why? Well, because if you look at y hat of t plus h, our forecast, it's equal to not one smoothing equation, but it's related to three smoothing equations. So we have L of t to denote the smoothing equation. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, we have L of t, uh, which is like, yeah, which is the smoothing equation. And then we have B of t for the slope and S of t for the seasonality. Um, and then uh, you might notice some additional variables as well. We have this beta star and the gamma. The beta star is in the, um, the slope equation and the gamma is in the seasonality. And those are just other smoothing parameters. They're the exact same as alpha. Um, and we also, you see in um, the forecast equation up above that we also have a H, a M, and a K. So what are those? Um, H just denotes the amount of points that you want to forecast. And the number of seasons in a cycle, uh, which is usually measured in years or, or months or days, but it can also be measured in seconds or minutes, it just depends on your time scale, is represented by M. And K is an index which ensures that your forecasts are going to be based on the appropriate season. So, for example, if I was going to forecast my sales and I wanted to forecast my sales for January, um, my M would be 12. And um, if I was doing them by month, let's say, and K would be 1 because uh, January is the first uh, month of the year. And so even though this looks a lot hairier, the structure is, is all the same. Um, L of t, B of t, S of t, they're all exponentially weighted. Um, the only difference is that they have different smoothing parameters. And 
for S of t, uh, you have a relationship of gamma divided by Lt minus 1 plus B t minus 1. So you're incorporating um, uh, the, both the your data and um, the slope. And that's because this is the Holt-Winters mul multiplicative um, method. There's also an additive method, and the multiplicative method is, is what is influx, what is in influx db, um, and uh, the additive approach is used when the seasonal periods are constant, but the multiplicative method is used when the season, seasonal periods are changing proportionally to the level of this or, or slope of the series. So if we think about like seismic activity, for example, um, I'm, I'm no like geologist, but uh, in my head, I picture a signal where as the earthquake becomes more severe, the periods start decreasing and the amplitudes start increasing and maybe the slope um, increases as well. And uh, that can be, that behavior can be encapsulated by the multiplicative method. Um, but also if your uh, proportionality, if, you're, if your periods are constant, then that proportionality will just uh, reduce to one and and you essentially have the additive method. So the whole Winters multiplicative method is um, a little bit more thorough, uh, which is why we use it um, in InfluxDB. Um, so now it's worth noting that um, we have not just, and by the way, I put the forecast and smoothing equation for single exponential smoothing at the bottom here for reference. We don't only have, um, one alpha and one L naught, and we now have alpha, L naught, um, B naught, S naught, B star, and gamma star that we need to find. So now all of a sudden we have six parameters that we need to optimize for. So this problem just got a lot hairier. And that's why I showed you the proof for single exponential smoothing because I hope now you understand um, that we, we're gonna need to use a different means to find those parameters. And the first difference in finding those parameters is that for Holt Winters, people use the RMSE to evaluate the error rather than the RSS. And RMSE is the same thing as the way that we calculated the error before. The only difference is that we take a square root of that. Um, so we take the difference between our prediction and our actual data, we square that, we sum all those, and then we take the square root. And the reason why people use the RMSE is just simply so that your error term will be on the same scale as your data so that it's a little bit more tangible and can make sense to you off the bat. But what that also means is that um, your math is gonna be a lot hairier. So if you are familiar with differential equations, um, square roots are not really your friend. Um, and a lot of times when you do complex problems with differential equations, you actually can't find a solution. Um, you can't solve the problem. So that's why people created numerical methods. And numerical methods are just a math tool or a math shortcut that enables you to find an exact or approximate solution to a problem. And the way that we do this with Holt-Winters, the way that we optimize um, Holt-Winters is with the numerical method called Nedler mean method. And I wanted to take a moment to also share with you a really famous type of numerical method because if you did have a STEM background, uh, you might this might trigger some some long some distant memories um, of stuff you learned in school. But LU decomposition is a really really famous uh, numerical method and incredibly important to tech because without it we wouldn't have computers. And um, what it allows you to do is solve a system of equations by representing um, those equations as a matrix and then with just using uh, multiplication and addition, you're able to create these other fancy matrices, one's called a lower and one's called an upper, where half of the matrix has zeros on one side and half of the matrix has zeros on the other, on either the upper half or the lower half. And then you do some other just addition and uh, multiplication and you're able to solve um, your system of equations. Where if I had to solve a hundred system of equations by hand and use, again, air quotes, real math, I would have crazy quadratic functions. I mean, it would be a mess. I'd have to isolate each variable and then plug them all in and it would take me days. But LU decomposition takes seconds. So it really reduces your execution time. And that's why numerical methods are so important, not only because they can help you find solutions to problems that you 
might not be able to find solutions to with real math, but also approximations to those problems, but also because um, they vastly decrease your uh, execution time. And that, I mean, that's the real benefit to them. So the way that um, this is handled with the Nedler mean method is that, um, remember that bowl that we created for the optimization of linear regression? Well, you can imagine that we would have something similar like that, similar to that um, for Holt Winters, but it would be in like a bunch of dimensions like six because um, we have many more parameters that we're trying to solve for. And the way that Nedler mean works is that um, a simplex, which is just the generalization of a tetrahedron in arbitrary dimensions, it's just like a pointy triangle, um, is placed in that bowl. And uh, it's kind of like an, an animated glob, but it's dictated by rules in a for loop. And these rules make sure that it can only move downhill. These rules ensure that it stretches a little bit in each direction, determine where the downhill is. And once it's found it, it moves a little bit more in that direction. And it repeats this process until it can't move anymore. And when it can't move anymore, at this point, we consider that the simplex is happy and that we found our minimum. So this animation is really useful. I, I can't play it right now for some reason, but um, I think it's because it's just a picture. Could find it on YouTube, but I think you can understand what's happening. So um, this is a contour plot in 2Ds to help you visualize it. And so the simplex started at the very bottom left corner, and then it reflected itself and it got a little bit bigger to make sure that it understands where the downhill is and then it reflected itself again and um, it keeps doing that and expanding and contracting and shrinking. All this behavior is just dictated um, by a for loop and then it keeps doing that until it finds the very bottom. Um, so um, these uh, uh, series of um, operations applied to it in a for loop iteratively is what makes it a numerical method because we're not doing any other math other than like putting the simplex in space, ordering all the values that are in that space of the simplex, calculating the centroid of the simplex, reflecting, expanding, contracting, and shrinking, and, the, and that process which is just primarily ordering numbers um, and doing maybe an average um, allows us to find the center of our plot or the minimum. Um, rather. So uh, that's how we calculate all of the initial parameters and all of our smoothing parameters for Holt Winters. So finally, we are at the meat and crux of this presentation, which is how do you actually uh, calculate a or create a forecast with InfluxDB? So I am using uh, my data set is from the National Oceanic Administration Association, I think that's the right acronym. Um, and, and all it is is uh, water levels from uh, streams and rivers and such. Uh, and I'm focusing on a stream in Santa Monica. So if you guys aren't familiar with InfluxQL, it's um, the query language for Influx. It looks a lot like um, SQL. Uh, and so you select um, water level which is your field from your database, and my database is NOAA Water Database, Autogen, um, and then you include your tag, location is on Santa Monica, and your time your time interval. And um, you can see that this is what my data looks like, and also that I start to have a really clear seasonality around August 22nd or August 23rd. So, um, and what I mean by that is that like the pattern becomes really consistent. So we have like a smaller peat hump and then a big hump and that, that keeps repeating. So I'm gonna actually only use data from beyond that point to generate my forecast. Um, but, but that's what it looks like. Oh, and I think the water level is in feet. That's right, so fluctuates quite a bit throughout the day, which is kind of cool. Um, and so uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, that I need to do in order to use Holt Winters. There's some some values that it that the function takes, and um, the first one that I need to find is the distance between the peak. So I need to find the distance between that valley and on where that blue dot is, and um, the peak adjacent to it. And the way I'm going to find that um, time span is simply by just visual inspection. So I uh, have looked hovered over that um, graph right there, and I see that the valley happens at uh, um, about 318. 
and I hover a little bit over to the peak and I see that happens at 936 and so um, that's for uh, approximately 379 minutes will be the value and the reason why I want to do that is because I want to um, match the trends of my raw data by using the first function so the first so we'll group between um, time between peaks um, and use the first function to return the oldest value associated with the field key um, and so uh, in this way um, we group by that time span of 379 minutes and we make sure that we don't miss any of our peaks or valleys and that we've clearly uh, encapsulated or um, represented our data with as few points as possible. Um, and I want to make one comment about the first function, which is that like data is really valuable, but more is not necessarily better. So if we use like an aggregate like mean instead of first, um, it would obscure the shape of our data and our prediction would be poor. So the reason why we're using first is just because we want to um, have a way of representing our data as effectively as possible. And so now that we've done that, we're ready to actually use um, the whole winters function. Uh, so one second. So all we have to do is say select Holt Winters with fit, first water level, um, 10, that input 10 there specifies how many points I want to emit. Four um, is the amount of uh, points in a season. So if we go back, we see here the yellow dots um, represent how many points we have in a season. And we also see um, that we have an offset um, and I found that offset just through visual inspection, like I did the distance between the seasons. You could also um, not include an offset um, and just uh, change your uh, time time window. Um, but um, yeah, so we uh, say select Holt Winters with fit. First water level, 10 the out number of points on output, four the number of points per season from our database, where we include our tag and time is a certain time. Um, until another time, group by 379 is the distance between the peaks, and 348 is the offset so we can sure to start at um, the beginning of a, of a, a season. Um, and that's all. And so now you can see that we have our purple data, which is our raw data, and the blue data is our Holt Winters prediction. And um, that's that's it. That's how easy it is. So. With that, here are some learning resources that I thought were pretty useful. And that's all. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone uh, have any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we've gotten a couple questions in so far. So we'll go ahead and start with those. But if you do have any questions for uh, Anais, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and just use the questions tab, submit your question there. OK, first one, what does the stack do to enable automating, automated learning, sorry, automated alerting and actioning on metrics coming in? That's a, that's a good question. So. Um, Capacitor is our not only our data processing engine, but also alert management tool. So you can set alerts um, for a certain threshold. So for example, instead of using a absolute time with Holt Winters, you could use a relative time. So just um, keep on predicting from the last 24 hours, for example. And then you could use Capacitor to set a threshold alert and send those alerts to VicDrops, PagerDuty, text, Slack, email, whatever you need. So um, that way you create a forecast, and if that forecast exceeds uh, your threshold, you can be alerted on it. Uh, also, you can create any sort of alert you want, but I mentioned the threshold alert, and um, I also want to include the dead man alert, because those are the alerts that you can create through the UI, um, through the UI piece or chronograph. Um, so it's always nice to have a, a clickable option um, when you're getting familiar with, um, with, with whatever you're working with. All right. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Mm, oh, so James is asking if you can put the learning resources slide back up for a second. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. 
Oh, so unfortunately, it's all links. So um, let me, can I just Wait. include those in the? Yeah, sure. So, so our, folks, we are going to be, um, everybody will be receiving a copy of the slide deck also, I believe, um, or you have the ability to download it. So you will be able to um, uh, access these links also. But Anais, just put them in the chat. Oh, uh, no, I didn't. The list. I put the yeah, yeah, not helpful at all. But there yeah. is a, a blog. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, sometimes I can't computer, so you know. Yeah, well, that's all right. We we all have days, so. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, so folks will uh, will be able to access those, but uh, at least she's giving you the list. Um, okay, while you're doing that, I want to kind of fill your head with another question here, which mm -hmm. is um, which programming languages have been used in the platform's development. Yeah, so it's all written in Go, um, except for uh, the, the the UI, um, which has JavaScript. But um. okay. All right, all right, great. Um, let's see. Uh, just a reminder, guys, if you have a question, go ahead and use the GoToWebinar control panel. Put it in. Next question: How can I ingest my data into the database? Um, so the, the the way that we recommend the easiest way is with Telegraph, which is our plugin driven collection agent. Um, there are over 180 plugins, so you can probably find something that will work well for you. And it's also database agnostic. So if you decide that you don't want to use InfluxDB at all, um, you can just use Telegraph because uh, it's completely open source. Um, but we also have uh, client libraries and a really simple HTTP um, uh, interface that you can use as well. So uh, there's a lot of options to you, but um, I rec really recommend checking out Telegraph. And also, if you do decide to use Influx and you have any questions, um, I am on the community Slack channel and community page all the time. Um, they're trying to offer you the best free support I can. So um, I encourage you to visit it and uh, ask us any questions if you need help getting your data in or, or doing whatever you want to do with Influx. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, right now, uh, we don't have any more questions. And so I'm going to give the audience uh, another minute or so. But while uh, while we're waiting to see if any more questions come in, I did promise at the top of the hour that we'd be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that now, kill a minute or two. Our winners for today's three $50 Amazon gift cards. First winner is Chris Stevenson. Congratulations, Chris. Second winner is, oh boy, Salo de Araujo. And I apologize if I messed up your name, but congratulations. And our third winner today is Tracy Mako, M-A-I-K-O. Congratulations, Tracy. And uh, thanks to you guys for joining us today. Um, we do have, looks like, another question, yay. Were EWMA and KDE algorithms considered in any of the studies? Let me see. Um, wait, where even? I wish I could see these questions. <laughs> They're but, in the questions tab. Yeah, I have the in questions the tab, tab open, but um, let's look. Um, I don't think, which one were the two that you asked about? They were? EWMA and KDE. Uh, not that I can see right here. So, um, hmm. yeah. Okay. Not in this right. study, but I'm sure there are others. Excellent. This, this one okay. was kind of just uh, decided to focus on some of the the algorithms that are getting the most press. Um, Hence the subtitle concerns and ways going forward, just because uh, even though, you know, um, mm -hmm. the algorithm has gotten a lot of press doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best fit for your data. So. Okay. All right. Great. Um, okay. Well, I looks like that is uh, going to be it for the question. So thank you to everybody who did submit a question. Uh, there were some good ones. Um, if you uh, if you have uh, a question for Anais later on, uh, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to follow up with you offline. 
um, you can uh, also the folks at uh, Influx Data will be getting a copy of all the questions. So um, I, we got to all of them, but you know, if if you need uh, anybody to follow up with you with greater detail, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to do that. So also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you miss any missed any or all of it, or if you just want to listen to it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out a link after today's webinar uh, in an email that will uh, enable you to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go check it out there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars and click on the on demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Anais, thank you for uh, what a great, great presentation. I'm normally averse to math, but that was really fascinating. So thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Great, great. And I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.